Eh, muchas gracias, Josie y Thank Elvin. Thank you, Josie and Elvin. I want to pass the presentation of the panelists. Maybe you can give us a, a, an explanation about the project that you're doing there in the refugees in the north of Brazil. Tell us a bit about the project that you're carrying out. This is a project that uh, consists in to, uh, helping the refugee people, Venezuelans especially, who are here in Brazil. From the communication point of view, we are part of different programs, and our mission is to guide, to orient the Venezuelans in the doubts that they have in their documentation, the institutions to visit, how, how to use the social media, because sometimes Venezuelans are very confused and sometimes even conned. Uh, so we offer services that have to do with documentation and others. So through this project, we want to reduce whatever confusion that may exist and to reduce the suffering that they may have, the refugee Venezuelans who come to Brazil. So in this communi community radio, it helps us of course, there are many rumors that sometimes uh, come around us, and we uh, we feel that radio has had a very positive impact. And through this project, uh, help uh, them to actually inform them about what is happening around them. Uh, thank you, Josie and Elvin, for that uh, brief presentation. And without more, I want to pass the word now the, to the three panelists that are uh, here with us today. The first is Nathaniel Raymond, an academic person from the Univers Yale University. Uh, second is Caleb Gituhi from an organization called Build Up. And then we have also Atania, an associate, a protection officer in UNHCR in Ecuador. Maybe Nathaniel, you could first present yourself and later on the next of the, the other panelists. Uh, it's really great to be here today, especially with uh, Josie and Elvin. Uh, it's fantastic to be on uh, a panel that has the voices of the people that UNHCR works to serve uh, in the field and partner with. So that's very exciting for me. Uh, I, as uh, Erica mentioned, I am a uh, uh, lecturer at the Jackson Institute of Global Affairs at Yale University and also a lecturer in epidemiology at the Yale School of Public Health. And I worked with uh, UNHCR to evaluate a uh, pilot project using what's called the TURN.io um, platform to communicate with uh, communities, particularly in Ecuador, in Mexico, uh, and uh, elsewhere. Uh, and for me, it was incredible, uh, and what I'll be talking about today, it was incredible to see the difference that um, messaging app communication with persons of concern um, how many areas uh, of life um, that messaging apps now have direct impacts on improving, but in some cases also can negatively affect. So what I wanna talk about today is what we found in our evaluation of the term platform and what that means specifically in a Latin American context, but also globally, over. Muchas gracias, Nathaniel. Uh, Caleb? Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Akale Pichuhi. I'm currently based in Nairobi. Um, my background is in um, tech and development and peace building, um, but have worked um, for a significant amount of time um, in East Africa uh, and with refugees from South Sudan into Kenya. And I've recently been working with UNHCR uh, in Nairobi um, to train some of their staff on some of the tech tools that they can use to engage um, with the refugee community. So. I'll be sharing some of those experiences that we, you know, have been able to um, capture uh, from the work that I've done before, and also what we're currently exploring now with the UNHCR in the region. Thank you. 
Buenas tardes, eh, mi nombre es Tania Salgado Vascones. Yo trabajo en el hey, área. Good afternoon. I work in the area of protection in UNHCR in Ecuador. As communication with the communities in operations. I was leading the march that we had here in Ecuador. We're also working with another other initiatives in social media and uh, ideas of protection in the country. So we are going to be talking about the experiences that we have had and also the lesson, the lessons that we have learned. Thank you for thank you for inviting me here. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentations. And now we are going to to enter in the topic of this session. And for that, we have a, a series of questions that I'm going to, I think Josie is going to start with those ones. Using digital channels uh, to actually use these particular channels in the consolidation uh, of, of the peace building and in the areas that where we have worked. So when do you think, what do you think are the benefits of working in these particular initiatives? Eh? I don't know whether Tania, you want to start a bit by trying to explain the situation in Ecuador. I'm going to just put the context that we have in our platform that was launched uh, in November last year. It was actually during one of the pandemic peaks, the peaks of the pandemic to have a, a fluent uh, communication with the population because the physical meetings were very difficult. So at the beginning, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were using WhatsApp web, but um, but we had to move to another platform that would uh, help us more. So the particular platform that we have, I think is very nicely positioned, more than 2000 people who are getting into the system and we're doing consultations in our platform. So we are generating information, actualizing information so that the plat platform can be more uh, useful and to transform the information into audio, especially for those who have visual problems. We have also put some images that can help uh, people. I think the important thing about this platform is the, the buildup of the same. We, we try and make uh, something that is very participatory because in my daily life, I feel that it's better to use other applications, uh, messaging apps, but we also know that the interest or, or that WhatsApp has a lot of interest because many times the telephones are very basic uh, in some particular areas. So sometimes if I, I want to chat, uh, many people sometimes if they don't have the right uh, uh, devices, it's difficult. So it's good to, to know what it is that they particularly use, but also to know which kind of information they're going to put. When we started with the first version, that we were trying to uh, to put, we had some particular information. We know that in UNHCR, we have a constant uh, practice of doing monitoring. So we had, if we sometimes we know the information that is necessary for the population, but when we started to do re revisions, we realized that there are some things that we hadn't known. For example, something that comes to my mind. We were trying to revise with one of the ladies, a communication ladies, and she was saying, I would want to know what I would do when uh, maybe there is an earthquake, because in, in our country, we don't have this particular area. So what would happen? What, how would I, what would I do whenever there's an earthquake, for example? 
so this type of information sometimes is not very clearly uh, there. So we discover them when we do these uh, evaluations with the different populations. And I think that is very important. And it's also very important, uh, something that has helped us. We have a particular tool that has been disseminated and propagated with videos, etc. cetera. Uh, we have also put uh, big banners, posters, uh, and that is important. We have identified that this can be used by people who are getting into Ecuador, something that also helps us of, to, to be guide to know exactly which kind of information to put there. And I think also it's an important uh, to constantly revise this uh, content, and not just a content, but also the use instructions. And sometimes that could be an obstacle in the use because sometimes there are gaps in the use of uh, digital tools. So we have to know how to use these particular tools in a particular way so that they can be, so that the benefits that uh, WhatsApp can be used in a clear way because if we do not identify the particular gaps, then we might not know how to consolidate that information and use it for the right uh, purposes. Uh, thank you, Tanya. And I know that Caleb also from BuildUp will have particular uh, examples of projects that uh, he has worked with, and maybe he can tell us a bit more the benefits that he has had in the different countries that he has worked in or areas. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Erica. Um, so I think a couple of things. One, um, when we've engaged um, with uh, technology, mainly social media. So I have not worked in a program that developed its own social media platform or tool. So we were using you know, the locally available, like the Facebook and the WhatsApp. Um, and one of the things, one of the, one of the benefits um, that we found was you know, when, when uh, uh, persons of concern or people in conflict engage in these tools, the, this, you know, there is a switch um, in terms of uh, the, 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 where they're situated in, in that engagement. So what I mean by that is, for, you know, sometimes engagement can be top down where, you know, we are providing services where it's, you know, it's not really focused on, on, on you know, communities, but it's focused on maybe giving them delivering services. But with social media, what happens is because we are not in those spaces and it is, it is the refugees who are in those spaces and the communities in conflict, then you know, they are best positioned to solve their own problems as opposed to having actors from outside come in. So being in those spaces, they're able to engage with others who are also in those spaces that we are blind to and start to shift those conversations that are either negative towards positive, um, towards a different direction. And what, what this means is you know, first that the aspect of agency is then restored in the sense that they are not no, they're no longer being viewed as, oh, we are just beneficiaries, but we actually have the capacity to get into our own spaces and shift them. So, so that comes with you know, sometimes um, you know, provision of necessary skills and, and, uh, and tools um, to be able to navigate those spaces. And we've been doing that, for example, with, uh, we, we tested that uh, in, in a university where we work with students and we're asking, can you navigate these spaces and address things like hate speech and polarization, and then um, take those uh, learnings into communities that are in conflict um, so that they're, they're the ones who are solving their own problems um, as opposed to somebody coming out from the, in, um, from the outside. Um, and then the other benefit we've seen is this element of being able to create community guidelines. So, so um, that then navigate uh, or, the, or protect the, the communities and the persons of communities in these spaces. So one example is um, in South Sudan, I, I once worked with a group that um, of refugees that had a Facebook group and they had very strict community guidelines in that they were, they were mixed tribes, but they were open to talk about politics, but on a, on a respectful tone. And they were very strict um, in how the, those conversations uh, would unfold in that if, if one person was targeting another person or was going against those rules, they'd be removed from that group and the group would be informed why this person was removed. 
and that um, idea of creating community guidelines where it's not somebody else telling you what to do, but communities are actually determining how do we want to navigate these spaces? How do we want to create an inclusive and, and a safe space for ourselves um, and hold a collective purpose where we are moving a social contract from you know, offline to an online space. Um, and then for, for peace builders and for humanitarian workers, it's just this um, ability uh, to, to access information on a, on a larger scale that helps them understand the perceptions, the fears, the hopes of the communities that they're engaging with. So, you know, before this information existed, but it was not readily available, uh, perhaps just because these tools didn't exist, um, or even, uh, you know, people didn't use this, uh, these tools. But um, one of the benefits of social media is this information is now um, possibly out there for, for humanitarian actors to engage with and learn, you know, the, the, the conversations, the narratives, what are people saying about COVID, about migration, you know, what are some of these things that are bubbling up that would take way much more time and resources to, to collect. Um, and, and, and just to top it off, you know, that also supports coordination in terms of how people then share information and, and creates this um, continued engagement with communities in, in, in conflict or communities escaping conflict. So with, with UNHCR specifically, having that understanding, we've been training the staff to then be able to engage with, uh, with community uh, persons of concern, knowing this knowledge, knowing that we are engaging not to show them what to do, but just to provide the necessary tools that then they can use in those spaces and then they sort of navigate those spaces and then we're just outside to support. So, so for me, I'm looking at it like the benefits um, you know, are more in, in terms of how these communities can um, own these spaces and, and navigate and, 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 yeah, and, and address some of their challenges. Thank you so much, Kale. Very interesting first, like, um, ideas and, and projects. Um, Nathaniel, perhaps you have um, some sharings that you would like to, to share regarding the use of social media. And I, perdón, me fui al inglés. Eh, el uso de redes sociales en, en aspectos humanitarios que quizás hayas evaluado. Especially the human, uh, human there's something that we had used uh, in whatever way maybe you've, you've, you've used them, maybe you can say something about it. So I just shared into the chat uh, a, I think, a really helpful summary of the evaluation that I did with UNHCR and the Innovation Service. And you can uh, look at that for more depth about uh, what I'm going to cover right now. I think um, Tanya and Caleb have really hit some of the critical points. And let's highlight the headline here, which is, the use of messaging apps by organizations like UNHCR represents a landmark moment in humanitarian aid because we are turning what had been dictation, talking at populations in need into a conversation. And what is we're seeing in that conversation is how much I'm gonna say we here, meaning big international humanitarian agencies, um, how much we don't know and how much what we've done in the past has been based on assumptions that now with tools like WhatsApp and platforms like Turn.io, we're beginning to see what populations are actually interested in. And we're being able to see those metrics against events in time. And just from Ecuador, for example, what was fascinating is to see at different waves of the pandemic, what people were interested in. Early on, it was school closings. It was housing assistance. But as time went on, it was livelihood programs. You can see in those trends, a level of granular decision support information um, that through uh, POC councils, refugee councils alone, um, we can't get that just by talking to community leaders. We can get some of it. <laughs> But putting that, that top level community leader together with this metric that's a bouncing ball <laughs> in real time gives a really good sense for organizations like UNHCR, um, sometimes of whole new areas of program that they need to focus on that they didn't even know about. Um, the other thing which was really surprising, and this was um, very clear in Ecuador, 
is how much time is saved by CWC and protection officers by having this platform. Before this platform, there was another hour to hour and a half a day of answering individual phone calls and now being able to load content into the system and have automated responses is actually allowing protection officers to do more protection work. <laughs> and for me, that was one of the fascinating outputs of this is that um, it allowed protection in CWC officers to actually be doing protection <laughs> in communication with communities. That was exciting. What was also exciting is to, I, I, and I hear this from Caleb and Tanya, this is not just about communication, it's about protecting people at risk. And for those of us who work in UN agencies and at organizations like Gale, we have been slower than the affected communities themselves to recognize that messaging apps is not just about communication, it's about protection and it's about early warning. And what we saw in, in certain cases that I reviewed um, with UNHCR is that the WhatsApp platform allowed POCs to alert UNHCR to fraud and say, oh, people are trying to take our registration information. People are trying to pretend to be UNHCR. And we can't scientifically measure how unique those warnings were compared to what we would get without the platform. But in some cases, that information digitally shared from multiple sources allowed law enforcement to be involved in a way that actually had a protective effect for um, displaced people. So that was really exciting. I had never seen before actual evidence of encrypted messaging apps being used to alert law enforcement to fraud. And that was exciting. And so are there risks here? Yes, and we can talk about that in a little bit, but this is the headline. The biggest risk of all is for agencies like UNHCR not to engage with messaging apps. There isn't really a choice here. <laughs> and a lot of organizations have acted like, oh, well, we're focused on data breaches. We're focused on this type of communication. If you're not on messaging apps, you're not working with communities in the 21st century, period. And so it's exciting here to see you in HCR uh, say, okay, we need to be proactive because if we are going to build relationships with the communities we serve, we're doing it on WhatsApp and platforms like that. And that's not a choice. Over. Muchas gracias, Nathaniel, for compartir. Thank you, Nathaniel, for sharing all the different benefits and uh, when you're using it also together with the challenges, uh, the different uh, technologies for the organization and also for the people that we serve. And uh, therefore, I'm going to now talk about the second question that Elvin is going to be talking about, to mention. To so the question for the invited people is, what are the challenges for this type of projects using these uh, social media and messaging apps in humanitarian areas and especially in the consolidation of the in peace building efforts so what are the challenges i think i can continue three challenges the topic of, in the use of WhatsApp, for example, one of the challenges, one of the challenges is that some populations have uh, gaps in terms of access. It was clear that some particular groups of people, especially the older people, were having problems of how to use WhatsApp. Uh, for us, it's easy. But for some of those people, they just don't know how to use them. They don't know how to send messages so that the information can get to people. And also when you teach them how to do, well, they still continue having this problem because these are deep problems that maybe require a bit of time. So we've done a bit of explaining. We've also tried to train 
uh, people, uh, member uh, organizations to explain how to use them so that they can help those people how to use these uh, messaging apps. So to strengthen also so that they can be able to use these particular applications. And I think that in those particular populations, we have to look for other strategies um, beyond uh, social media. But I think we have to continue trying to train them to, to know how to use them. The other challenge that I've seen is the connectivity issues or problems. In Ecuador, we have an advantage that when people get into Ecuador, when they buy I a SIM card, which is a very relatively cheap. They have a limited time for, for a particular time. It's actually free. And that is actually unlimited access to Facebook, to WhatsApp, etc. But nevertheless, uh, some people simply just don't have connectivity issue. And I think that's a great challenge because I think there's still a major uh, connectivity gap. So we have to strengthen that uh, community uh, effort to help to solve that problem of connectivity so they have access. But I think that particular uh, gap, that particular challenge is a structural challenge that not only affects the use of WhatsApp, but also in this particular uh, context of the pandemic that has changed many things affects many other people. We also, we're also talking about the universal access to internet, for example, it's a discussion that we have been thinking about, but for the time being, it's a challenge. It's a challenge in you know, the connectivity issue. And the third challenge, the third challenge, uh, I think is, when you talk about WhatsApp, the challenge of to have uh, the content uh, actualized, uh, updated, that is something that is uh, very real. Uh, it doesn't help me if I have WhatsApp, but that 20,000 people coming in and sometimes information is changing so fast. <clears throat> and I think it's a platform that we can use, that can change, I can do validations so that to know that what I'm having is something uh, that is useful and that is real. But the other social media like Facebook or TikTok that is now also very famous, it's even a bigger challenge because the content, uh, you know, sometimes you don't have a quality uh, content. We, what we have done is to strengthen the influencers the community leaders so that they can generate that content. And I think that has been uh, very interesting, that kind of work. But that has also allowed us to have uh, information flow that is constant. Sometimes it's a challenge because sometimes when you talk about TikTok, it's easy, for example, to talk about some particular topics, but it's difficult. Uh, to talk about other kind of topics. So um, uh, sometimes I can even pass a particular link that I can show here. People who do a lot. It's also a challenge to see how they use this content and content. And, and they have the commitment to generate this content and to use to reach the population. I think it's a challenge, but uh, the most viral TikTok that we had was one that referred to uh, migration to uh, regularize the situation of Venezuelan people. And the people liked it a lot and were amused, found it funny, amusing, and it attracted a lot of followers. It was a ch challenge, but it was something which uh, had a great creativity. Yeah. Thank you, Tanya, for sharing 
uh, sometimes challenges can be turned into opportunities. Caleb or Nathaniel, I don't know if you'd like to share some of the challenges which you have identified in this project of communication through uh, digital communication with the uh, displaced people. Um, yeah, I can jump very quickly. So um, yeah, a few challenges. Um, so one is social well, social media spaces and, and just even messaging apps are, you know, are polarized spaces or can be easily polarized very quickly, um, depending on what's trending today or who is in the group um, or something somebody says. So just that being aware that that is a space that you know, when, when engaging in that space, it's not uh, uh, necessarily a safe space unless it is an intent to create safety. Um, and that it's, uh, you know, it can burn up in flames very quickly. And if, if you have brought people into that space um, and they're caught in that crossfire, then, you know, you're basically trying to, to, to navigate and, and, um, and cool down tensions. Um, and so you end up spending most of your time doing that. So, so that's a challenge is just out there. Um, and especially for refugees who are just, you know, uh, from a conflict context, um, you know, they've just left, a, you know, a context that is also polarized. So some of those conversations might follow um, onto social media spaces and, and just play out um, in that space, uh, even within um, settlements. Um, so that's just one, always being aware that that's a, that's a present challenge. Um, the other thing is um, with new technologies coming up very quickly um, and, you know, and new functionalities and you know, technologies that exist being rolled out, the tools that exist to fully understand these spaces are not yet, um, you know, fully or are not yet developed for um, peace building actors or, or humanitarian actors. And what I mean by that is if you, if you look at the technology tools out there that or the tools that help actors to map or to monitor or to understand social media, they're mainly used for commercial purposes. They're used by companies to monitor a brand and to monitor, uh, I don't know, an, an item that is being sold out. And those settings, uh, you know, sometimes do not align with what um, humanitarian actors are looking for or peace builders are looking at. So if you think about tensions, how do you monitor tensions on social media using a tool that was meant to monitor the sale of shoes. You know, um, it's just telling you this time is trending, but uh, yeah, that's it. So, so if you think about uh, as peace builders, how peace builders usually do conflict analysis or conflict mapping, how do we, and they have tools they, that can be used offline. Are there tools as practitioners we can use to understand these digital spaces, especially in contexts where there are people of concern? So there are a, like build up. We are building, trying to develop something in that direction, and we just set up something in that direction. But there are also challenges just because of you know these platforms are also then owned by uh, tech companies that have their own um, restrictions. Um, so so that's one. And then the I mean that's the second thing. And then the other the other challenge um, we've seen is just um, the concept of the, the space that uh, refugees ex uh, engage in these social media spaces are also you find non, what we call non-human entities. So you have bots that are engaging in the same spaces. Um, so just, just that, that lack of clarity about whether you're engaging with a human or um, you're actually engaging with a bot that has been set up and designed to you know, push you or nudge you in a different direction is also something we need to be quite aware of. And, and the last thing is the, the social dynamics sometimes make their way onto, or not sometimes, but more often than not, we make their way into social media spaces where, um, you know, where users will take up a technology tool and they'll get a link maybe from their local pastor and they'll believe it more than somebody else, just because uh, their local religious leader or their local elder or the local community leader has just that social, the value is higher than perhaps even the units you are. So they are more likely to believe that than, you know, and just because the, these, you know, the window between how, you know, when they get that information and when somebody else is trying to verify, you know, is sometimes short or long, then the, you know, misinformation can creep in, disinformation can creep in and things like that. So just being aware that 
social media has these skills and always trying to navigate and, and knowing that the tools we have are not fully um, capable. I, I just want to give a, a shout out here um, to what Caleb was just saying and saying before about particularly social media use in South Sudan. So I served with UN uh, Department of Peacekeeping Operations in supporting the Joint Mission Analysis Center in South Sudan. I just want to say how complicated social media is and, and dangerous in South Sudan in terms of its role in activating armed actors, such as within White Army, within the Nuar, et, et cetera. So I'm really fascinated, Caleb, and would love to see a case study about the moderation you were talking about online and it, see the idea of moderation uh, rules in online communities for peace building is a paper I would love to read. So <laughs> that's <laughs> that, that would be fascinating. And, and you're making a really important point about um, platforms built for selling shoes that we're now using in armed conflict environments. And I, I call this phenomenon normal use case, and meaning that um, we are taking technologies, just as you said, that were developed for quote, normal use case in the West in a commercial or global North in a commercial context. And now we're using it in a war zone. And uh, so the big challenge here is, is that challenge number one is um, what are our standards for evaluating from a protection perspective, a commercial technology developed for the opposite environment of the environments in which we're working. And then the, the second challenge, uh, looking at Tanya here and what you guys have to go through in, in Ecuador is the challenge on content creation. So we, we think we have technology, it makes it easy. The amount of translation <laughs> you have to do, the amount of developing new content to feed the beast, um, is huge and so how how do we how do we give you the right capacity and it's not just cwc it's not just protection officers it's tech support it's um all sorts of different types of specialists for you to have not only the capability but the capacity and competency and culture at your field level to be able to get that feedback loop right because it, it's you know, sort of like um, it's a conveyor belt that never ends. If you stop feeding the beast, then you're breaking trust. You're breaking that feedback loop with the local population. And once you lose them, they're going to go elsewhere. And so this is the, the critical challenge. Um, three critical takeaway challenges, and I'll, I'll shut up here. One is the connectivity and digital invisibility problem. Research I've done with my, led by my colleague, Dr. Danny Poole of University of Geneva, we look at something we call teledemography, which is how do we map the gender and social economic barriers or dynamics around connectivity? And I, I think as the MUAC strip, middle upper arm circumference and modern child supplemental feeding practices, we're revolutionary in the eighties for humanitarians, teledemography, in understanding the way in which gender, ethnicity, and economic status relate to connectivity is the missing science of humanitarianism in the 21st century. Um, what we saw with Syrian populations is that um, men have more SIM cards than women, but women were sharing SIM cards with other women. So one woman with a SIM card in Ritzona refugee camp was actually five to six women being connected because they were sharing that card. So challenge one is how do we have a science around understanding connectivity differences from an anthropological perspective and cultural perspective in micro context? That's thing one. Thing two is really how do we develop the right content for the right communities at the right times, knowing that back to point one, yeah, the way you communicate, you're not communicating one-to-one. -one. You're communicating one individual can be a conduit for six other unconnected individuals. So how do we make the right decisions about 
this networked communication where it's not just who's online, it's who they're talking to offline. And then the third and final point here is really the, the humanitarian data protection. We're still figuring it out, but it's really 10 years behind where we need to be. It is so focused on someone breaking in and stealing um, basically PII, personally identifiable information from a server. But most of the biggest harms for these populations is not on PII breach. It's on someone pretending to be UNHCR and telling them that they're in danger. Um, it's someone telling them that they have 24 hours to leave or they'll be killed. And they've sent that message on WhatsApp or Facebook. That will do more damage than what we are protecting against, which is data breach on a server, which for most of these POCs never even think about and doesn't directly affect them as much as someone saying, oh, if you don't have a card, I heard on Facebook, if you don't have this card, you're gonna be deported. And so the, the final challenge is how do we begin to think about the threats, not that we face as agencies, <laughs> but populations on the ground are facing in real time. Because if we don't do that, they're gonna delink from us. And you all are gonna go elsewhere to find the information you need. And we're just gonna be sitting here talking to ourselves. Over. Puntos muy, muy importantes, Nathaniel, que, que de seguro que desde... El... That, that is very important, uh, Nathaniel, that from the humanitarian point of view, we have to take that in account in order to carry out this project. And along this line, the next question, which uh, Jos is going to ask, we'll, uh, try, we'd like to get his ideas on recommendations. What recommendation can be given to users or external actors that have uh, a role in this type of initiative in order to consolidate it for its uh, implementation or application. Tanya, would you like to start? Recommendations. I, I think the, uh, my recommendation have to do with what Daniel was talking about, about the risk which people uh, experience when they enter into our networks. I wanted to share that it's very important for us to have several strategies and to tell people how they can notice whether when uh, UNHCR is the one is that is contacted them and whether it is safe to share information. And before, this might seem small uh, issues, but uh, recently, a uh, 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 friend in wrote to uh, people in Venezuela from uh, Facebook, and they said to me that uh, they were sure I was not from UNHCR because I wrote to them on the weekend, and that, uh, that was uh, saying. Uh, so I, I said, I thought that it was very good that they said that because in the things that we do in our activities, uh, I, I, the activities that we are carrying out are reaching these people, at least that, that answer uh, gave us this idea. Uh, but uh, the recommendation uh, and the starting point is to know that all the activities that we carry out as humanitarian workers have to have the point of view that we can't harm the population, do no harm. We are responsible for their security. And if we open Facebook, we have to send the message that do not share information on the Facebook page. And not only that, but uh, I should have a very systematic follow-up of everything that they put in the Facebook page and to have rules, very clear rules, uh, and tell them that if you put uh, data there, I will delete them because they will put you in danger. And they are real uh, dangers And in exchanging uh, information with the people in Mexico. They had um, uh, 
people put their information in in uh, Facebook, and those who are looking for them were able to uh, to locate them. So uh, uh, we have different uh, contexts, but the risks are real. We have to have very clear strategies to avoid putting people in danger, because that is the most important. That that would be my most important recommendation. Because apart from having clear and updated information, information, I think the most important thing is not to put people to risk and the uh, population with which we work. Uh, we have to have very clear ideas about their security. This should be a starting point uh, with any intervention in social media that we make. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tanya. Caleb or Natanya? Yeah. Uh, to, uh, to, oh. oh, sorry. sorry I, I thought you had finished. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. So, so I just want to jump off on what uh, Tanya said because she lays a very good foundation about a couple of things. One is um, the this aspect of you know just I think alluding to digital media literacy, knowing what to share, what not to share. So, so I think. I, you know, what we've seen is there is a need to go beyond just training um, uh, digital media literacy because one, a couple of things, if if you just train people on how to use these technologies, that's it, they, all they have is a skill um, on how to avoid this and avoid that. But, um, you, you know, what, what we've seen work is going beyond digital media literacy on, and training on skill, but training people how to be more responsible, how do they hold a social contract within these spaces. Um, because um, we've seen some of these problems are, are, are rooted in, um, in you know, privilege of power and inequality. So you find, now that I know, um, I can easily change it or tweak it to be something else. So just giving somebody the skill you know, and, and ending there, it's like, you know, now how, how do you become responsible with that skill? So that we don't just end at click a button and delete a post or click a button and move a group. So, but how can that skill be now used to, to you know, to bring cohesion and, and you know, and, and just, yeah, create a safe space. Um, and then the other, the other uh, point is getting ahead of the curve, especially for agencies like UN. Um, what I mean by that is as new technologies are emerging, um, being in that mindset of this is a new technology that is emerging and it has, these are the elements that can easily be manipulated for, for conflict or to, to harm refugees. Or, or if it's an existing technology and new functionalities are being developed, um, being aware that this functionality can easily be manipulated. And, and we've seen, um, for example, uh, recently UN Women and TikTok merged together to, you know, to develop this um, in-app solution to address, um, I think it was uh, gender-based violence um, uh, on, on TikTok, because they found that there's some spaces that can be easily exploited that are already being exploited. And how do we seal those spaces before they get too big and we're trying to play catch up. Um, and it's like, wait, we, this thing has been happening for the first 10 years. So being or not being ahead of the curve, but being aware that things are changing and not just waiting for communities to tell us, we are using this new app today and you don't know even how it's being downloaded or, or you know, just, just being aware of this is a new tool, these are things that people can be using and this is how they can be exploited and, and trying to get into those spaces before they are already taken over. And then the last one is just amplifying voices that are usually in these spaces, but um, uh, you know are, are either not seen or uh, overlooked. Um, and it may not necessarily mean amplifying them, but either supporting them. Because sometimes we might we might focus on conflicts so much, or in these spaces, we might focus on the tensions in these spaces that we fail to see that there are voices in those spaces that are um, you know not allied allied to organizations, not allied to UN, not allied to religious groups, but just individuals who are trying to shape, uh, you know, communities by trying to unite them or trying to create these safe spaces. So identifying those, you know, who they are and seeing how can they be supported because the more these actors are, um, you know, disappear because they feel stifled um, or, you know, they feel like this space, they're being crowded out then the more um, harmful these spaces become for um, persons of concern um, as they engage. Yeah. Muchas gracias, Caleb. 
No sé si Nathaniel tendrá Thank you, Caleb. I don't know if Nathaniel would have some recommendation either for human, humanitarian workers or for uh, any re relevant actor in the application or design of these initiatives. So four, four quick ones. One for, one for NGOs, um, including UN agencies, one specifically for UN agencies, <laughs> one for, um, and I'm looking at uh, Jossie and Elvin, one specifically for um, POC communities and one for funders, uh, foundations and corporations. So for those who are engaged in this space, um, stop focusing on the technology and start focusing on the human capacity, uh, building off what Caleb and Tanya said that it, just because you have a car, it doesn't mean you know how to operate it, right? You have a license and you go to driver's ed. Um, we have focused more on the tech than we have focused on the human element in using the tech in, in what I call the social digital terrain. We talk a lot about cyberspace and it's not really cyberspace. It's the intersection of social systems, physical infrastructure, and informatics, which is information about information. And we have overinvested on the infrastructure part, and we've under underinvested on understanding social networks and social impact. And we've also uh, not invested enough on understanding what information is needed, what are our information requirements in specific settings. And so we focused on coding and tech, and that really wasn't the need. <laughs> and, and then the recommendation for UN agencies, and I, I say this in the report, is end user license agreements. Right now we have, uh, or eight big agencies are negotiating directly with organizations like Facebook. We need to um, work together to create a common baseline EULA for humanitarian operations that is shared across humanitarian agencies. And it is the one-to-one -one negotiations with big tech companies that really needs to end. We need to have a common EULA, common end user license agreement that enshrines humanitarian principles and human rights standards into the EULA. So back to Caleb's point about platforms built for selling shoes, um, part of having a humanitarian EULA is saying you can't commodify refugee data and take it out of the algorithm. And you also can't make these populations hyper-legible. And so I would, I'd prioritize that. Now looking at Jossie and Elvin, um, the recommendation to you guys is that you have power and you, you, you have power and you need to use it in an organized way. And basically, as Frederick Douglass said in the United States talking about the end of slavery, power concedes nothing without a demand. So you, you guys need to demand how you want to be communicated with and really um, at demand participatory processes about how communication campaigns are designed. Um, so my recommendation is be loud. <laughs> and then the, the last recommendation to funders is um, the 2010s are over. <laughs> We're in the 2020s now. And we need to move beyond this, the internet is gonna figure things out, guys, <laughs> approach. And funders need to be focusing on not what we want tech to do, but what we wanna prevent tech <laughs> from doing. And so that means that organizations like many of the folks on the panel today need funding to develop the expert capacity on the local level um, to implement like Caleb is doing, to implement um, tailored contextual communication campaigns with local capacity. And that requires a shift in where we're spending our money. It's harder to fund these organizations, but just because it's hard, it doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Over. Thank you so much um, to all of you for your wise recommendations. Uh, Josie, um, or Elvin, 
Le paso la palabra. Okay, now Josie or uh, Elvin, um, you answer. Thank you for all the recommendations. We'll take them into account, the advices that you have given us. Uh, um, and now maybe if some is, maybe we have some question for, from panelists. Uh, is there any question from them? Uh, right now, we don't have anything written, but if anybody wants to raise his hand or to ask a direct question, he could um, ask that at any time. Otherwise, we have some prepared questions for the panelists, even though we have only two minutes left. If nobody wants to ask, Elvin may uh, ask uh, question number three in order to sort of close this issue of recommendations on digital uh, on digital risks. Okay, sí. uh, well, let me ask question number three, and it says the following. Uh, do you hear me? There goes the question. Oops. Creo que están en mute o soy yo que no les escucho. Um, Josie, Elvin. Ah, ya, bien. Uh, okay, here we are again. Could you could you please uh, repeat the question? We, because we lost connectivity, we had a problem of connectivity. I'll repeat the question: How could we, from the humanitarian world, reduce the digital risks uh, connected with the use of uh, social media and uh, using of messages by vulnerable people? Thank you. Nathaniel, I, I don't know whether you who have spoken so much about this risk, do you have any specific recommendations on how to uh, implement this by humanitarian people and people who work in this space? Um, do you have any recommendations? Yeah, one, one, one quick thing is that oh. right now we we do not have standard humanitarian guidance on how to do this risk assessment. And so uh, a lot of colleagues, including UNHCR, um, Internews, MSF, Red Cross, OCHA, Mercy Corps, um, we are just talking together now about how to develop this initial guidance uh, and we, we are doing work and we're having a, yay, we're having a meeting uh, <laughs> next year. Um, we, we are, we're late and we're slow on developing protection standards for communicating with communities and for developing really risk assessment on information environments or the infospheres of vulnerable populations in a systematic way. Um, so the, the number one thing that we need to do is hear from Jossie and Elvin and Caleb and Tanya uh, about the risks you're already facing. It shouldn't be a bunch of white guys like me <laughs> in a room and having to get in a room in Geneva to figure out what you already know. <laughs> and so we need to be hearing from affected communities um, and you guys need to be in that room. That's really the headline. Oh. Muchas gracias. Y quizás la última pregunta ya para cerrar, eh, ¿qué recomendación le daría? Thank you. The last question to close. What recommendation would you give to any organization that is thinking about working with these strategies of uh, communicating through uh, digital uh, risks? I don't know whether Tanya uh, would or Kali would like to give a recommendation. Uh, what Nathalia, Nathania said, you have to talk with the population. Uh, otherwise, uh, we have to talk to the population to ask them what, what is happening. 
That's the only way that we can create uh, appropriate tools and also to, to uh, preempt risks. So if somebody listens, we, we can um, preempt the risks. <laughs> Muchas gracias, Tania. Y también Thank you, Tania. And we can see that Caleb has written on the chat that he agrees about including uh, people of interest in the discussions, uh, not only in the, in the creation and design of this type of tools, but also during the implementation and development of them. I don't know if you have any comment, additional comment before we close this session both on uh, part of the panelists or the, the participants. And if, I think we have stolen four minutes of time. We should have finished five minutes ago. I don't know if Josie or Elvis want to say bye to the people who have participated today. Obviously, yes. Thank you very much to the panelists. Uh, th th thank you for believing in our project. Thank you for accompanying us in this moment. And we hope to have another opportunity to share with you and uh, from our hearts and uh, from all the Venezuelan refugees, we thank you uh, from the depth of our hearts. Uh, uh, thank you, it's been an honor. Enjoy the rest of the sessions of the conference, and we hope to be able to speak to you in uh, near future. Uh, good day, good night, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you.